Welcome everybody to Long Crime Daily. I'm Jesse Weber. Another week, week is in the books in Broward County, Florida for rapper YNW Melly's murder trial, but not before a witness stirs some controversy, not for the attorneys, but in the jury box. Jamel Demons, known by his rap name Melly, is accused of killing two of his best friends inside of an SUV in the Miami area in 2018. He's now on trial in South Florida for murder, and he could face the death penalty if he's convicted. Week two of trial has been seeing multiple expert witnesses, including an undercover officer who didn't want to show his face in court as he testified about local gangs. But an important face that we did get to see in court was the defendants. Long crime correspondent Terry Austin is on the ground in Fort Lauderdale and has details on the YNW Melly's interactions from the courthouse. YNW Melly is paying very close attention to what is going on in that courtroom. He's being very serious. He's actually looking at the monitor and he's looking at the witness. He's looking at the prosecution asking questions. I have not seen him looking at the jury, but I definitely think he is focused on this trial. It seems as though he understands the seriousness of the case and he's very, very focused. Continue watching us on Lawn Crime. We are covering this gavel to gavel. Okay, now let's circle back to the undercover officer from earlier today because his appearance sparked a conversation between the judge and a juror. The officer wanted to wear a mask in order to protect his identity as he addressed local street gangs, but it reportedly caused a juror a full on panic. Yeah, two messages uh, during the last witness's testimony. And uh, the first one said, uh, I don't feel comfortable. Why does he uh, get to see us, but we can't see him? Mm -hmm. Is that your message to me? Yes. And the second uh, was, I need a moment. I can't listen properly. When I was a child, I had seen someone uh, get robbed and am having a, an anxiety attack. Yes. And I guess my concern is, uh, are you able to, to uh, sit as a juror where you think this is too much for you. I'm trying to trying to figure out, and that's why we took a, like a little extended lunch break mm -hmm. uh, to figure out um, whether you're, you feel comfortable and you're up to it. Yes, I feel comfortable, but I just don't think it was appropriate for someone to be masked up like that. Um, and plus, you guys didn't even tell us. Like, you just, and you don't know what people have been through, so it just, like, it shocked me, like, it shocked. So, um, yeah. But I do feel like I can handle it. But um, that just was inappropriate. I'm sorry? I said I don't believe that was appropriate. Uh, well, some things, I, I make certain decisions about uh, things, uh, and uh, then we, we go forward with it, and I instruct yours, and are you, think you'd be able to follow those instructions uh, and you pay attention to the evidence or you think that you're concerned about the the masking that is going to affect your ability to, to follow the instructions and follow the evidence? Yes, I can listen to follow the evidence now that I know he's going to have one mask. And the anxiety issue, we're past that, you're okay? Yes, yeah, it's my vacation. I'm joined right now by my co-host and defense attorney, Brian Buckmeyer, and also special guest, you see him there, Florida State Attorney Dave Arenberg. Dave, I'm gonna start with you, your special guest today, to mask or not to mask? That was the question for one witness during the trial. How would you balance the safety of that witness with this clear anxiety by the juror? Good to be with you, Jesse and Brian. There is a better solution here. In our office, when we have someone like this, a gang investigator who doesn't want his identity to be seen, we put on a disguise, but don't use a ski mask. That is anxiety generating when you put a ski mask on someone. Look, it, it could hurt the defendant's right to a fair trial because it looks like uh, the defendant is more dangerous to the jury. Also, it could hurt the prosecution because a key witness for the prosecution could get discounted because the juror feels anxiety over the witness. So instead, you put a disguise on, like a beard or something that doesn't intimidate the the uh, the jury, or at the very least, warn the jury in advance what's going to happen and why they're wearing a mask, so you don't shock someone like this. Okay, so the rubber nose, the glasses, the mustache, got it. <laughs> I thought it. I thought the same thing. Uh, so Brian, you know, the prosecution, they continued to try to get YNW Melly's social media and messages before the jury. I think that was an important point. Did the judge make the right ruling with respect to that? 
I think the judge is continuing to make the right ruling in terms of separating the relevant information from the social media. We understand that the judge, uh, sorry, that the prosecution wants to color this case in terms of that of his uh, his music, his his gang affiliation, and that's an important thing for the prosecution because that's an aggravating uh, argument to try to get the death penalty. But I think it needs to be probably connected. It needs to make sure that this is his phone, this is relevant to the information, and this is something that's going to help the jury get to the ultimate conclusion. My problem with it is they barely even have a case to put the gun in his hand. Why color this case with so much, what I would say, prejudicial information? Prove that he had the gun. Then you can bring in the extra stuff. Don't put the, the, the horse before the, the cart before the horse, so to speak. Mm. You and I were talking about how it's really going to be up to these closing arguments to tie so much of this together, particularly for the prosecution, because it feels a little disjointed. That's something I think we'll all be looking to. But by the way, it would have been hilarious if we jumped back to me and I was wearing the disguise, but I didn't know what Dave was going to say, but that, you know, maybe for another case. Well, still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, it is some of the strongest evidence against the accused killer of the Idaho Four. We're learning more about the match between the suspect and DNA found at the murder scene. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily, everybody. Brian Koberger's defense team is preparing to go to trial. He's accused of stabbing four University of Idaho students to death in an off-campus home. And this week, the prosecution confirmed that genetic genealogy was used to identify Koberger as a suspect. And they also say that the DNA in the case is a statistical match to him. Law and Crime correspondent Anjanette Levy has the details. Brian Koberger faces burglary and first-degree murder charges for the deaths of Maddie Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin last November. We've known since Koberger was charged last year that prosecutors claim DNA found on a knife sheath on Maddie Mogan's bed was 99% likely to have come from a child of Koberger's father. But prosecutors say further DNA testing has revealed the DNA found on the knife sheath is a statistical match to DNA collected from a cheek swab of Brian Koberger. Basically, that's just fancy terminology for they got a DNA hit. And with DNA, it's not just one test, boom, they got it. There's always a confirmatory test, a second confirmatory test that gets done. It's, I think it's more of a procedural thing. James Bogan is a defense attorney who's followed the Idaho 4 case. The revelation about the DNA being a statistical match came in a prosecution motion asking the court for a protective order on the investigative genetic genealogy techniques used by the FBI in this case. The motion is the first time the prosecution has acknowledged publicly and on the record that investigative genetic genealogy was used to find a suspect using DNA found on the K-bar knife sheath which prosecutors now say was found partially underneath the body of Maddie Mogan and a comforter. James, what do you make of the prosecution seeking a protective order for this investigative genetic genealogy material? The state says in their opening paragraph they're seeking to protect the names and personal information of, they're saying, hundreds of innocent relatives on the family tree and the names of the publicly available genetic genealogy services used and certain um, other information that's described in the motion. It's quite a lengthy motion. Now, I could see wanting to keep innocent parties out of a uh, you know, public record for a criminal case, but obviously, you know, what you're always concerned about as a defense attorney is you want to be able to look at everything that uh, could be relevant to the evidence in the case. The defense is asking for a speedy trial set for October of this year, despite receiving mountains of evidence from the state with much more to come. Following that request for a speedy trial, which is Koberger's right, his attorneys now want to stay or delay the proceedings because they can't reach an agreement with prosecutors on what material they will be given from the grand jury proceedings. Grand jury proceedings are secret, with prosecutors presenting evidence to obtain an indictment against a defendant Prosecutors used a grand jury in Koberger's case. It should be noted that the bar to obtain a grand jury indictment is very low. Koberger will be back in court next week as his lawyers argue their motion to have grand jury materials released to them. For Law and Crime, I'm Anjanette Levy. 
All right, Brian, according to these court documents, Koberger is a statistical match. The DNA is, get this, 5.37 octillion times more likely to be Koberger. What does that mean? All right, so let's break it down. It's a statistical idea. There's what, 7.8 billion people in the world? Uh, that's nine zeros. Octillion, as it suggests, is eight, rather than billion being two. That's 27 zeros. So what it is saying is there is a 5.3, and then you put 27 zeros after that, that a one in that, that it's is Brian Koberger, but there's only 7.8 billion people in the world. So it is very, 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 very close to saying that it is basically him because there are that, only so few people in the world that statistically it's gotta be him. And now, Dave, how does the prosecution use the quantity of DNA and on the sheath and where it was found to ultimately secure a conviction? I'm still trying to understand that math lesson from Professor Ruckmeyer, but uh, <laughs> okay. that was it's actually a lot. Really Just go with it's a lot. No. It's a lot, right? Look, this guy is toast, okay? Put another way, prosecutors are gonna make hamburger out of Koberger because it is a match. And, you know, science doesn't lie. People may lie, but science doesn't. And look, they already have the cell phone records. They've got the white Hyundai. They've got an eyewitness, uh, the description that matches him. Now they've got his DNA. It's enough DNA that it eliminates his only possible defense that I brushed up against that sheath in Walmart and that's why I'm on it. Yeah. No, there's too much of his DNA on it. He's done. Well, those are defense arguments and they will be interesting defense arguments if they're ultimately presented in a court because this just feels like such a big linchpin in this case and going to be very hard for the defense to argue against.